contrasting the benefits and drawbacks of each iOS device for the blind and visually impaired. For the purposes of this video, the devices I'm referring to as iOS devices are the iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch. It can be argued that the iPad is running a slightly different operating system now since it's been renamed to iPad OS, but it's all essentially a variant of iOS, which is the operating system that runs on the iPhone. So we're going to start off with the iPhone. This is my iPhone 11 and it's in a Nomad Active leather case. If you are sighted and watching this, you can see that it has a sort of wrist strap or a lanyard attached to it, which I find very beneficial when I'm walking. It's super easy to just tether it to my wrist and that way I know that I'm not going to drop it and have to search for it. It's really beneficial for GPS apps and visual interpreting apps like Ira, things of that nature. I personally believe that every visually impaired person should own an iPhone. It's the most versatile piece of mainstream technology that you can own. It can do a shocking amount of things. This is so much more than just a phone for me. It's my GPS, it's my book reader, my barcode scanner, my visual interpreter, my scanner, all kinds of things. I use it every single day for so many different things. I actually use this to do a lot of schoolwork when I was taking a psychology course over the summer and working as a counselor at a summer camp. I carried my iPhone and my Smart Beetle refreshable braille display and that is what I used to do 99% of my psychology assignments while I was at that summer camp. Is it ideal? No. Did it work? Yes, it worked surprisingly well. I got my first iPhone when I was 13 years old and have been using iPhones ever since. My iPhone goes everywhere with me. While I can't say that it is a laptop replacement, it does a lot of things and it can get me by in a pinch when I need it to for things like schoolwork and my job and things like that. It also could easily be a replacement for a braille note taker if you paired it with a refreshable braille display. In my opinion, it's the most versatile mainstream device that a blind person can own. It's just so beneficial in so many areas of life that I think every visually impaired person could benefit from an iPhone in many different ways. Now we're going to move on and talk about the iPad. This is the sixth generation iPad. It's a little bit outdated now, but I purchased it in 2018 and it's still working perfectly fine. I'm clinging on to it as long as possible because it still has the home button and the headphone jack. I think that most blind people could benefit from owning an iPad alongside an iPhone. A lot of people argue that the iPad is basically just the iPhone with a bigger screen, which is true to some degree. But now that the operating system on the iPad has been rebranded to iPad OS, it's gained a lot more functionality and more features than the iPhone has in some regards and the bigger screen can just be beneficial in a lot of areas, especially if you have some remaining vision to the point that you might be able to read things on the screen or see some of the buttons. It can be beneficial if you want to use it as a magnification device to enlarge documents and things like that. It can be super beneficial in that regard. Also, as a totally blind person, I find that the larger screen can be beneficial in certain situations. For instance, if I'm trying to use apps that put a lot of things on the screen at once, like Voice Dream Reader, for instance, which is an app I use on an almost daily basis for school, that has a lot of buttons on the screen and it's easier for me to sort of touch them on the first try on the iPad screen because it's bigger and they're not as crammed together than it is on the smaller iPhone screen. I can still use Voice Dream Reader on my iPhone perfectly fine and I do a lot, but I find myself swiping through all the buttons on the screen more often than not to find what I need on my phone. Whereas on the iPad, I can just 
touch it and tap what I need on the first try. I also prefer my iPad for editing documents. For instance, if I'm editing something in the Microsoft Word app or in Pages or taking notes, things like that, it's more beneficial to have the bigger screen, again, because the buttons are more spread out and it's easier to find things by touch. The iPad, in my opinion, is the closest thing to a replacement for a traditional Braille note taker that you can find in a piece of mainstream technology. I keep my iPad in a Bluetooth keyboard case most of the time and will pair my Smart Beetle to it, and it has completely replaced my BrailleSense Polaris. I have not used my BrailleSense Polaris since I took my last math class because my iPad can do everything that thing can do so much better and faster. I carried my iPad in its Bluetooth keyboard case with my Smart Beetle when I was taking college classes on campus, and that is how I took notes. I just opened pages and I could type notes with the Bluetooth keyboard, check them on the Braille display. You could even just use a Braille display if you prefer typing on a Braille keyboard. I personally prefer a QWERTY keyboard experience over the Braille display on iOS, but it's 100% doable with just the Braille display. I have done it before. If you are a high school student or college student or even an elementary school student, an iPad can be very beneficial in many regards. I also use my iPad for work. It's how I manage the Challenge Solutions YouTube channel and do some of the website maintenance. I use it for email a lot because it's quicker to grab my iPad and use my QWERTY keyboard than it is to deal with Gmail sometimes. While I don't consider an iPad a true laptop replacement as many people say it can be, it can be super beneficial and I think this would be a good starting device for blind students. Instead of handing them a Windows laptop and trying to teach them JAWS right off the bat, I think an iOS device like an an iPad with a Bluetooth keyboard and a Braille display could be more beneficial simply because it's easier to learn. VoiceOver is way easier to pick up and use than JAWS or NVDA for Windows is. VoiceOver just works 99% of the time once you have learned the basic gestures, whereas I still find myself consulting the JAWS user manual even though I started learning JAWS when I was 7 years old. I am now 21. So that's nearly 14 years of dealing with JAWS and I still get confused and have to Google keystrokes in order to use it efficiently. Whereas I very, very rarely have to do that with the voiceover for my iOS devices. I also think that an iPad would be an excellent device to buy instead of a Braille note taker like a BrailleSense Polaris or a Braille note touch simply because it's mainstream technology. Sighted people use iPads all the time and blind students can fully access and use all of the features available to any sighted person on an iPad with voiceover. It makes so much more sense to hand them a mainstream device that the rest of their peers are using that can do all of the same things that a braille note taker can do and then some better and faster than it does to buy a much more expensive piece of soon to be outdated technology that is made specifically for the blind and visually impaired. You can get a baseline iPad for a little more than $300, a decent Bluetooth keyboard for under $100, and a Smart Beetle for a little under $1,000. And that is an excellent setup that can fully replace a braille note taker in most situations. I do need to offer the disclaimer that if you have a student who is taking math classes, a braille note taker can be beneficial. However, I'm of the mindset that if your student is a braille reader, they need to be doing most of their math in braille. We have a video on math for blind students if you want to know more about that. Also, if your student is interested in music and needing to read braille music, they're still going to need a braille note taker because that is the easiest way to access braille music files. I do not know of a way to do those things on an iOS device or any mainstream device for that matter easily. I used my BrailleSense Polaris up through pre-calculus and I know that Macy still uses hers for music a lot of the times. So note takers are not completely unnecessary. They are absolutely necessary in some situations, but an iPad with a keyboard and a braille display can replace them for most blind students and it's much cheaper. Next we're going to talk about the iPod Touch. 
This is not a device that I would recommend for most visually impaired students. It's a little outdated. It's running the iPhone 7 processor. It doesn't have Touch ID or Face ID. It can't do phone calls or anything like that. It's not going to work with Ira unless it's on Wi-Fi. And I personally wouldn't want to do any kind of heavy braille note taking type functionality on here. I wouldn't want to use pages on this thing or anything like that for any extensive amount of time. Could you do it? Yeah, probably. Should you? No, not in 2021. I own this iPod Touch because I found it on sale and I wanted a device that I could dedicate solely to books, music, YouTube, things like that that are not associated with work or school. I get texts for work and emails for school and all kinds of Blackboard notifications and just things associated with life and productivity on my iPad and iPhone all the time and I wanted a device that would just kind of be disconnected from that and when I found this on sale I jumped at the chance to get it. I would not have justified it otherwise. I love this thing for that purpose. When I plug headphones into this thing, which yes, it does still have a headphone jack, I'm kind of disconnected from my work and school life. I listen to things on this a lot while I'm falling asleep, but it's not really a productivity device and shouldn't be necessarily treated as such. With all that being said, if you have a much younger blind child and you're not really sure how well they're going to do with iOS or you don't necessarily trust them to be responsible enough to take care of a very expensive device like an iPad or an iPhone, this is a really good starting point. It's $200 if you don't get it on sale for the base model of storage, which should be fine for most people. It won't be the end of the world if they break it. It runs voiceover very well, although it is laid out a little bit differently than other iOS devices. It can Bluetooth to headphones if you want it to, or it's got a headphone jack so they can use earbuds with it. It will work with a braille display. If you wanted to connect a keyboard to it, you absolutely could and use it as a note taker in some situations, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. It's a good basic starting device if you have a younger child or a student who you want to test out on iOS to see how well they're going to do with it. It's an excellent device on which to learn iOS. However, again, I wouldn't recommend this per se for high school students or older blind people. It's just outdated. This was released in 2019. That's when it got its last update and as of now, it's unclear as to whether or not Apple is going to continue to refresh this device in the future as most people just use their phone and iPad as an iPod because they can do the exact same thing. But again, if you just want a device that won't be the end of the world if it gets shattered, this is a good one. And it is excellent for a younger child with small hands. I actually love this because I have pretty small hands and it's really easy for me to just hold one-handed or throw in my pocket and use and again it's my book and music device so it's like it's my happy place it's my entertainment device that doesn't get slammed with iMessages and emails all the time. That concludes this comparison of iOS devices for the blind and visually impaired. If you have any questions or suggestions for future content, please leave them in the comments below or send us an email via the contact form on challengesolutions.org. Please give this video a thumbs up so the YouTube algorithm continues to know we exist. And remember to subscribe to the Challenge Solutions blog 